Hello, I'm Trish Rifo, president of the American Bar Association. It's my pleasure to send greetings on behalf of the world's largest voluntary association of lawyers, judges, law professors, law students, and other legal professionals. The ABA's relationship with state and local bar associations uh, is woven into our very identity. The ABA was founded in 1878 at the behest of state bars who saw the need to establish a national voice for the legal profession. To this day, representatives of affiliated bar associations, including of course the DC bar, make up the majority of the ABA's policymaking House of Delegates. And we are proud to share leaders with you, such as DC's state delegate, Rob Weiner, and our mutual former president, Carolyn Lamb, and so many other DC lawyers who volunteer their valuable time and tremendous expertise with the ABA. As lawyers, we in our bar associations always need each other, especially during these challenging times. Together, we expand access to justice, help lawyers develop new skills and insights, promote the critical need for an independent, fair, and impartial judiciary, eliminate bias and enhance diversity, and work every day to exhibit why the rule of law is so precious and so critical, not just here at home, but around the world. And as we emerge from the pandemic, we will work together to build a justice system that is even more just, that provides even more access to more people in better ways, and that moves us ever closer to the promise of equal justice under law. Let me recognize Chief Judge Blackburn Rigsby and Chief Judge Josie Herring and President Kleinberg for their tremendous leadership of the bench and bar. And thank you to all of you for your involvement in a robust organized bar that serves the public and our profession. My best wishes to all of you for good health and continued success in all that you do. more than any other geographic location. The District of Columbia is associated with the practice of law and the administration of justice. The DC Bar is now the largest integrated bar in the United States, with more than 110,000 members from all 50 states and over 80 countries who practice in every conceivable area of law and include government, nonprofit, solo practice, and business settings and firms of all sizes. Here at the DC Bar, our mission is to serve our members so that they in turn can serve the community. Membership in the DC Bar entitles you to a variety of confidential, in many cases free, services and benefits. Whether you're contacting our legal ethics hotline, obtaining practice management guidance to build or grow your practice, talking to an expert counselor about addiction, stress or wellness, attending a networking event, or participating in our annual celebration of leadership, our highly trained and responsive staff is ready to assist you. Our nationally accredited continuing legal education program offers hundreds of courses each year in a wide variety of practice areas, ensuring that you can earn CLE credits for any jurisdiction in the country. And here at the DC Bar, we develop future leaders in the law through the John Payton Leadership Academy. The DC Bar also has a long tradition of service, both to its members and to the public. The Bar's service to the public is best demonstrated through our award-winning Pro Bono Center, a national model for providing access to justice for those in our community 
who cannot afford a lawyer. A separate nonprofit legal services organization, the Pro Bono Center mobilizes 1,500 volunteer lawyers to serve more than 20,000 individuals, nonprofits, and small businesses annually through our full representation clinics, our court-based resource centers and attorneys of the day, and our neighborhood walk-in clinics. Transforming lives by serving our clients where and when they need us most. The DC Bar is a dynamic organization, and much of this valuable work is done by volunteers, like you, participating on our committees, task forces, working groups, and in our communities. We encourage you to get involved and get to know your bar leaders. Our 21 communities have something to offer for everyone, regardless of practice area or experience. These communities provide content to their professional networks and peer groups and get the firsthand opportunity to hear from experts and officials in their field. We are heavily invested in building community. Our newest community is for the law students, and we are hoping to build a pipeline, not only to admission to the DC Bar and its communities, but to prospective employers as well. Students can take advantage of networking events, writing opportunities, mentoring relationships, and leadership programs right alongside our practicing members. Developing these future leaders and giving them the skill set to succeed is a key goal of our organization. I encourage you to explore our website, dcbar.org, where you can find detailed information about our diverse portfolio of program offerings, all of which are designed to reinforce our steadfast commitment to service, integrity, and leadership. Again, the DC Bar is here to assist you in making your practice a successful one. We are committed to serving our members so they can serve the community. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you. Good morning. I'm Jeffrey Kleinberg, president of the DC Bar, and I am pleased to welcome you to day two of the 2021 District of Columbia Judicial and Bar Conference. We hope you enjoyed yesterday's programs and look forward to continuing to explore how we can collectively learn from our experiences during the pandemic to improve our legal system and expand our fellow citizens' access to justice going forward. Before we begin, I'd like to give a brief report on what we have been up to at the DC Bar over the past year. Since March 2020, the DC Bar has operated on a fully remote basis. Our wonderful new building has been closed to the public for over a year, and the Bar's employees have been doing their jobs in the same way the rest of us have, over Zoom and over the phone. So, for example, member services have continued to respond to member calls and emails, the Legal Ethics Program continues to provide ethics advice over its helpline. The Attorney-Client Arbitration Board has conducted multiple remote arbitrations and mediation hearings. Most CLE courses and communities programs have been delivered virtually. In April 2020, one month after the shutdown, our CLE program was already offering courses such as time management for lawyers working remotely and understanding paid sick leave time and emergency paid sick leave time in the wake of COVID-19. Within six months, the Bar has offered over 60 additional programs focused on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our Practice Management Advisory Service has sponsored a whole series of programs, such as managing a law firm in the new normal, how to reduce stress and still meet your revenue goals, returning to work safely amid COVID-19, and how to stay sane when working from home. Our communities have sponsored programs such as COVID-19 and commercial and residential leasing, the evolution of telehealth and practical applications in response to COVID-19, and unemployment insurance benefits under the CARES Act, what attorneys representing employees need to know now. The pandemic altered our 2020 conference celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment which had originally been planned as an in-person event over three days in June. We regrouped and reconceived it as a live virtual broadcast over two days in late October. The conference featured an all-star lineup of speakers with welcoming remarks from DC Mayor Muriel Bowser, videos about women's suffrage and voting rights, some truly engaging plenary panels, and 12 CLE accredited breakout sessions. For its part, the DC Bar Pro Bono Center has not missed a beat. 
although phone calls and web conferences have replaced traditional face-to-face -face interactions for volunteers and their clients. The Pro Bono Center has continued to provide vital legal information and service to the community. Specifically, the Pro Bono Center's Consumer Law Resource Center has provided remote services to nearly 400 customers with emergencies and other consumer issues since the pandemic began. The Family Law Assistance Network, which is a partnership among the Pro Bono Center, the Legal Aid Society, and the D.C. Affordable Law Firm, has helped individuals with questions about D.C. family law cases and with filing pleadings with the Domestic Relations Branch. Since March 2020, this network has helped more than 700 clients. The Landlord-Tenant Legal Assistance Network has helped more than 1,700 pro se tenants and small landlords since June of 2020. And while the court-based Landlord-Tenant Resource Center remains closed, unrepresented tenants and small landlords seeking legal information can call a hotline for help from a pro bono center attorney. The Pro Bono Center's advice and referral clinics have been replaced with dedicated telephone lines for clients with urgent legal questions involving individual civil matters. And the advocacy and justice clinics, in partnership with pro bono volunteers, continue to provide full representation in housing, family, public benefits, personal injury defense, and consumer law matters. Finally, the Pro Bono Center's nonprofit and small business legal assistance programs have also operated remotely, offering free one-on-one -on -one consultations to nonprofits and small businesses on pandemic-related issues. It has continued to operate its small business brief advice legal clinic on a weekly basis. So while the pandemic certainly affected most everything we've done this past year, there were some things that would have happened anyway. So for example, last summer, the bar adopted its new strategic plan that will set the priorities for the bar until 2025. Under the guidance of former presidents Susie Hoffman and Tim Webster, the plan adopted by the Board of Governors last June comprises six overarching goals. To lead within the legal profession, to empower individuals, to enhance member value, to provide public service and professional excellence, to foster community and connections, and to encourage organizational and operational excellence. The bar's executive leadership and staff are already well on their way to operationalize this plan, developing programs and implementing policies to further the bar's mission. The bar also took a major step this year to clarify how communities can issue public statements and file amicus briefs. As most of you probably know, the communities are voluntary associations within the DC bar that are funded entirely by the contributions of their members. The DC Bar's Board of Governors revised the existing policies, both to protect the First Amendment interests of the DC Bar's members and to encourage those who join the voluntary communities to engage with and participate actively in the free exchange of ideas on matters in which they have genuine expertise. Finally, I wanted to let you know that the DC Bar is about to celebrate a momentous birthday. On April 1, 1972, in the exercise of its inherent powers over members of the legal profession, the D.C. Court of Appeals created the D.C. Bar as an official arm of the court. That means that next year we will be celebrating the D.C. Bar's 50th anniversary. We are still in the early planning stages, but we hope to have an in-person conference and celebration in the summer of 2022 to mark this important milestone. So the state of the D.C. Bar is strong, thanks to the dedicated staff of the Bar, the Board of Governors, and all of the volunteers. It is because of all of them that the D.C. Bar is able to make good on its unofficial motto, to serve our members so they can serve the community. Thank you very much. Now, the Bar would like to take a moment to honor the 13 judges of the local and federal courts of the District of Columbia who have resigned, retired, or taken senior status during the past two years. Their collective contributions to the district have been remarkable, and we are grateful for the opportunity to celebrate them today.
Again, on behalf of the DC Bar, we thank the 13 judges for their tireless service to our community. We encourage everyone in attendance to reach out to the judges to congratulate them on this important milestone. Now, I am pleased to welcome back Chief Judge Anna Blackburn Rigsby, who will introduce our keynote presentation this morning. Thank you, Mr. Kleinberg, for updating us on the state of the DC Bar, which we know is strong. You all have done an excellent job this year, pivoting under the challenges of COVID-19. I'm now pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Damaris Smith, Damar Smith is the executive director of the National Football League Players Association. Mr. Smith enjoyed a long and distinguished legal career prior to his arrival at the NFL Players Association. He was an assistant United States attorney in the District of Columbia and was counsel to then Deputy Attorney General Eric H. Holder Jr. Mr. Smith also served as a partner in the law firms of Latham and Watkins and Squire Patton Boggs. He has since proven to be a tremendous asset to both the NFL Players Association and the players he serves. Most recently, he led the negotiations to create sweeping COVID-19 protections and protocols for his membership. He obtained comprehensive testing and opt-out provisions for players, and he designed the return to play agreements that secured NFL players being paid their full salary for the season, despite the projected $3 billion shortfall for 2020. His demonstrated ability to shape the legal landscape during the pandemic made it an easy decision to invite him to share his experiences and provide his insights on what lies ahead. Also, please join us in welcoming conference co-chair, Judge Joshua Deal of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, who will lead us in the conversation with Mr. Smith. Good morning, everyone. My name is Judge Joshua Deal. And it is my distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Morris Smith. And he's asked me to call him D, so that's what I'll do. D is a longstanding member of the DC Bar, served for nearly a decade as an assistant United States attorney here in DC. He has litigated throughout the DC court system in the DC Superior Court, the DC Court of Appeals, as well as the United States District Court for DC and the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. He's seen it all. After his time as an AUSA, he served as counsel to then Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder in the Department of Justice, and then moved into private practice as a partner at Latham and Watkins and Patton Boggs. He was then unanimously elected to his current position as Executive Director of the NFL Players Association. Dee, thank you so much for joining us today. Judge Deal, thank you for having me, and uh, good morning, and it's great to be back, uh, back home, uh, as it is. Um, I, I enjoyed my time uh, as a lawyer, uh, really growing up in the bar there, and it's just a privilege and an honor to be here today, so thank you. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, as you know, our conference this year is focused on how the courts and the legal profession have responded to the challenges of COVID-19. But before we dive into that rather broad topic, could you just tell us a little bit about your path to becoming executive director of the NFLPA and what that job entails in a more ordinary year? <laughs> uh, I, I think the first thing I would say about this job is it's almost never ordinary. It um, uh, certainly was more more challenging this year, but uh, I, I think the best way to start off is, you know, if you can, can look behind me, uh, you're on the executive floor of the NFL Players Association. Um, we're a labor union. Uh, we make no apologies for, for being a labor union. Uh, we represent all of the active players, uh, their wages, their hours, their working conditions. Uh, my my uh, foe or my counterpart on the other side is uh, uh, Roger Goodell. He's the commissioner of the National Football League. Uh, he represents the owners. Uh, I, I happen to represent the good guys. So um, we, we take our job seriously um, each and every day here. We're really fighting to make sure that our players are protected. Um, we, we make sure that, um, that their interests are being served. Everything that occurs uh, both on the football field um, and, and in the training facility and the draft um, is something that, that we collectively bargain over. And every 10 years or so um, uh, since I've been here, uh, we, we negotiate a new collective bargaining agreement. If, if you had to, you know, sort of pick one thing 
that a labor union uh, does. It's negotiate uh, collective bargaining agreements between uh, us and management. And uh, we just got done with one of those, um, hard to believe, uh, a year ago last Friday. Um, and um, as we know, uh, almost two or three days later, the world changed. So we went from negotiating a uh, hotly contested uh, collective bargaining agreement that, that covers uh, uh, 11 years um, and, and literally rolled over into successive collective bargaining agreements around wages, hours, working conditions uh, in the paradigm of COVID. So uh, they, don't, they don't really let me be much of a lawyer anymore. Um, my, my job primarily is to harass uh, the lawyers on staff and our outside counsel. Um, I, I still uh, make sure that, that I'm the final look on all of the briefs, but um, uh, I'm thrilled with this job. We have 147 people here who've committed their professional life to the betterment of our players. And um, each and every day we try to bring it um, and bring it to a level of, of expertise um, that our players do on the field. And uh, we're, we're proud of it. I, I want to pick up on the topic that you were in the middle of a collective bargaining negotiation last year, right around the time that the world is starting to drastically change. Yep. Um, and so let me ask, was there a particular moment last year when it really hit home that if the season was going to happen at all, it was going to have to look drastically different from the seasons before it? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I think um, the the first questions uh, we asked, um, and, and it's you know really the the way I've been trained as a lawyer um, is to ask the should question: Should we be playing football in a pair uh, in a uh, during a pandemic? Um, our collective bargaining agreement was ratified on uh, I think March twelfth. Um, I had my first COVID task force meeting on uh, the thirteenth. Um, and, and the question back then um, on the heels of the NCAA March Madness shutting down, basketball shut down, baseball um, had shut down, hockey um, had shut down, was whether we should be playing NFL football uh, in a pandemic. And, and that question was, was sort of a moral, you know, part moral, part practical question. The moral aspect of it was um, I wanted to make sure that we weren't uh, and, and would never either overtax our, our healthcare system, because you know at the time that was the real threat that we were overwhelmed. Uh, the healthcare system had to make sure that we were never going to take COVID test or resources out of the community. And once we got to the should, um, to be brutally honest, it became a question of how do we manage a contact virus with a contact sport? And um, it, it to this day is still probably the hardest thing I've ever done in uh, my professional life. But, you know, we, we hired the best and the brightest. We followed the science. Um, we had a tremendous amount of, of input from our players. And, and just to be dead honest, um, our player leadership led us through COVID. Um, you know, as you know, some sports came back um, and didn't make it. We took the view that uh, anybody can start. The goal was to finish. Um, and, and bargaining in a way where we forced the league to pay for daily testing, uh, forced the league to change the off season, forced the league to get rid of preseason games, um, you know, required mandated changes in travel and practice. That was really the only reason that we were, um, had the opportunity to be successful. Well, let, let me pick up on that because, you know, as you said, you're the head of a labor union and your constituents, the players be put in jeopardy by returning to the field. You can't maintain social distance uh, during a football game. As you right. said, it's a contact virus uh, and you're playing a contact sports, uh, contact sport. So in the earliest days of pandemic response, what are the concerns that you're hearing from the players? Um, and how did you go about addressing those concerns? Yeah, I mean, look, we in, in March, April, May, June, all of us in the country were, were learning at a very steep learning curve um, about, um, you know, our not factors and um, methods of transmission, um, how long it would take to, to possibly uh, catch the virus, whether it was airborne or not, whether there were variants or not. Um, our players certainly had a lot of questions about um, what would happen if they went back to work. Um, 
my method of handling or, or dealing with this job um, is to remember what my job is. I'm not there to perpetuate football. I'm not there to perpetuate the game. If, um, if we couldn't figure out a safest way to play NFL football, uh, my advice to our executive committee and to our membership would have been not to play this year. But what we found was, especially looking at other businesses and, uh, and, and other industries, there were some people who uh, did a very, very good job of, of having workers come back to work. There were some businesses that did a very, very poor job. Um, if you looked at uh, the meatpacking industry, for example, uh, a shameful job of protecting their workers. Um, social distancing was part of it, uh, but but the science told us that if we could wear masks, cut down on, on social interaction, have most of the work occur outside, um, and, and cut down on the things that uh, exacerbated transmission, we could be okay. And uh, we started with, with limited practices, limited exposure. Um, I, I'm, I'm still you know, somewhat uh, uh, amazed, but, but think about this fact. We did not have a single in-game transmission of COVID-19, not one. Um, and, and I think that was because we, we did follow the science where we had problems was where America had problems, um, in closed places, um, people not being careful, uh, family members who came in contact with, with COVID-19, but, um, was there a lot of concern during the season? Yes. Uh, but I'm thrilled that we never got over a positivity rate of 1.3%. Uh, I, I think that, uh, Almost every jurisdiction in the country would have <laughs> would have dreamed of having a uh, positivity rate of something lower than than one and a half percent, but it didn't come without a tremendous amount of um, diligence, patience, and and expertise on behalf of our staff. Now, to a great extent, you had the benefit of being the last professional sports league to have to really confront this question. Of course, as you mentioned, the NBA was in the middle of its season. The NCAA had to cancel its tournament. Um, and I just wonder, you know, this is a little inside baseball for DC, sure. but the head of the NBA Players Association is an alum of the Public Defender Service, as am yeah. I. And yeah. you are, of course, an alum of the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, did you guys coordinate? Did you guys share information <laughs> about how you could best uh, respond to the pandemic? Or were there still hard feelings from your prior positions? No, there's there's absolutely no hard feelings. Um, I'll take it one step further. Michelle and I used to try murder cases against each other. So um, she's a tremendous um, leader, tremendous lawyer. Um, you know, when 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 their sports shut down, ours was on the, the verge of starting. And uh, the four of us, uh, Don Fear, Tony Clark, Michelle Roberts and myself are um, um, as as close as uh, brothers and sisters in this job. That, that you can be. Um, it's a it's a tough job. Um, only a few people really understand the job. Um, and, and we spend a lot of time, uh, let's just say, <laughs> commiserating and, uh, and, and sharing ideas. Um, we were, um, I'm not sure we were fortunate to, to learn anything from uh, baseball, basketball, um, and hockey. If, if you remember, their sports shut down so quickly um, that, that there weren't really any opportunities for lessons learned. Um, what, what we decided to do was simply approach this uh, from the ground up. Um, we, we have far more contact than, than almost every other sport, uh, but we have the luxury for the most part of playing outdoors. Um, and, and we took advantage of that. So we changed the way in which uh, where players dress. Um, normally they would come to work in the morning, go to the locker room, uh, check into uh, a room and, and have breakfast or have a, uh, had a meal when you realize that those places were um, likely the most dangerous places at an NFL facility, what do you do? You change it. Um, uh, daily testing was a, was a huge fight uh, between us and the national football league. Uh, the league did not believe that we needed to have daily testing. Um, the union took the position that if we didn't have daily testing, we were not going to play. Um, of course, lurking in the background, and, and I don't want to send uh, everybody listening this absolutely to sleep, but lurking in the background was the fact that we had a, the players had a very favorable uh, force majeure clause. 
in our collective bargaining agreements. Um, and, and that gave us a little bit of the better argument of, of what would happen if football didn't occur. Um, the players were likely to get paid anyway. And, and look, we, we understand, uh, well, let me put it this way. Any, anyone who sits in this position um, has to understand that, um, the, that a group of players are, are, are generally fighting with 31 billionaires. Um, and we're still living in a world where, for the most part, billionaires win. Um, but every now and then, the, the, the good guys get a little bit smarter, a little bit brighter. We had a better force majeure provision um, than they did. We used the leverage um, that we knew that we had. Um, and we crafted an agreement um, where um, we were able to um, achieve protections that kept our players safe. And if someone would have told me uh, back then that we were going to make it through 256 games of a regular season on time and crown a, a, a national champion on time, um, I'm glad no one asked me to, to come out with an over-under <laughs> about that. <laughs> But um, uh, it was an incredible, um, looking back, an incredible, uh, incredibly successful uh, endeavor by all of us. And, uh, and even the National Football League got most of it right. And, and as, as the pandemic rages and you're starting to put the pieces into place to play the season, uh, George Floyd is killed by a police officer in Minneapolis, sparking protests around the world targeting racial injustice, with some NFL players taking on a prominent role in those protests. Now, you've referred to playing the season as a moral question, and the NFL doesn't have the best track record for supporting player protests, with Colin Kaepernick being the most prominent example. So does that change the calculus or the landscape at all or trigger any second thoughts about going forward with the season? No, I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's, um, it's not binary. Um, we have 2,500 players who, for the most part, have a three and a half year career. If someone came to any lawyer out there and said, um, for whatever reason, um, their, their union thinks that it's better for them not to work for an entire year. And you're talking about one third of your earning capacity. You're talking about your ability to put food um, on your, your family's table. Um, I, I think every now and then I'm, I'm certainly aware that there are people outside of our business who um, treat this like a sport. Um, I don't have the luxury of treating it like a sport. Um, I don't have the luxury of, of treating it um, in an overly binary way where um, a group of people would say we shouldn't play for reasons A, B, and C and, and, and simply either indulge my, my personal feelings or the personal feelings of, of a small group of ours. We're a union. Um, majority, uh, minority is heard, majority rules. Um, if the players would have taken a majority vote and decided that they didn't want to play for reasons A, B, and C, my job, we're not going to play and, and we'll deal with it. Um, at the same time, when it comes to the issue of social justice, I, I think our history um, as a union is inextricably tied to the history of the civil rights movement. Um, we've made strides over the years not by eschewing the platform that we have, but by taking advantage of the platform that we have. Um, I was thrilled with our players when they ran out of the tunnel um, in St. Louis. It was then the St. Louis Cardinals um, before they moved to Arizona after, um, after a, a young man was killed by the police in Ferguson. Um, thrilled with Colin Kaepernick's stand, thrilled with the stand of our, of our players. Um, you're absolutely right. The league has not been um, uh, as open and as respectful uh, of the players' voices as they should. Um, and that led us to sue the National Football League when they put in their unilateral band over our, our players kneeling. Um, but once again, we're lawyers. Um, we sued them. We threatened to sue them in federal court. We also told them that our players were going to kneel at the um, at uh, the coin toss, they were going to kneel after a touchdown. They were going to kneel uh, during timeouts. Um, and we were going to sue you and I'd sue you until we either won or lost. Um, I think the league realized that that was not uh, a good place for either of us to be. They repealed their unilateral ban and we instituted a standstill agreement for a lawsuit. And, and so we, 
we carved out a place for our players to exercise their voice if they so choose. But I mean, that, that's interesting because so much has changed in the last three or four years. I mean, I, I remember uh, when there was the response to Colin Kaepernick and now it seems like a lot of players are kneeling and more openly protesting. And you think a lot of that, a lot of that credit goes to lawsuits or just kind of a change in um, sensibilities or, or what is it? Well, I, I, I still don't have the ability to look inside anybody's heart. So I'll cross <laughs> that out. Um, are some of our, are some NFL owners um, charitably in the stone ages? Yes, um, they are. And, and I know they are because they say things around me that they probably wouldn't want to say around anybody else. Um, and, and we've, we've acted aggressively in against, um, against the ownership in, in some cases, and that's not going to win me any, any, um, any holiday gifts from, from any of them. Uh, the job is simple. The job is to represent the interest of our players. And, and we are all, um, uh, mature, sober lawyers in a, in a very um, one of the best legal communities in, in, in the world. We understand the power uh, of the law. We understand the power of being able to aggressively uh, pursue the interest of your clients. Um, and, and I don't shy away from using every tactic in our tool belt, primarily because there is a clause in our constitution uh, that requires us to protect the gains that we have, to seek the gains that we don't have. And I, I love the clause in our constitution. It says by any means necessary. And, and for us, um, I know what that means. I, I think that that was a deliberate inclusion of that in our constitution when it was written um, in, in you know, almost 50, 60 years ago. Um, we, we go after this job in a way um, where our players demand that we be aggressive about their rights. And um, again, I'm not here to be a steward of NFL football. Um, I'm, I'm here to be um, a protector, a leader, and a representative of um, tremendous athletes who uh, I enjoy watching just like everybody else enjoys watching. Focusing back on the pandemic a little bit, um, the DC courts, law firms around the district, legal practice in general is struggling with how to safely resume. Um, you know, the DC courts have largely reopened after a brief period, but things are very different. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wonder if you could just talk with us for a minute about how decisions were made in the NFL about how to resume games, what the best practices were, how many vendors to let into the stadiums, what personnel was essential. Um, and just how, because I think, the NFL, in many respects, has been a leader in showing the rest of the world how to reopen safely. Um, so if you could take us, uh, give us a little peek behind the curtain of how those decisions were made, uh, I'd love to hear it. Yes. Well, I, you know, look, I, I, I think that we were extremely successful as a business. And, and I think that there are um, certainly there is a history of um, of of. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat between this union and the National Football League. Um, we, we took a zero-sum approach about concussions back in 2009, 2010, when no one had a concussion protocol. We wrote that, um, and and from that from that time forward, I think we developed um, a, a pretty good method and a pretty good plan for how we protect our players. We simply go in and in, into the market, find the best uh, experts, have them come up with a um, protocol North Star. Um, that becomes um, that becomes our baseline, and we drive everything towards that ethical um, and 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 physical and moral um, um, North Star of how we protect our our players. So how does it happen? Um, the first thing that happened was we meet with the National Football League. We tell them, for example, that we. Um, are going to insist on daily testing. They tell us that that's going to cost upwards of $100 million. And we tell them that's the cost of doing business. Um, after that, I'll spare you some of the conversations that went back and forth because it's probably not safe for, uh, for primetime listening, but. Um, they have an editing button. <laughs> um, you know, collective bargaining is not supposed to be 
um, static um, and polite and 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 simply uh, formulaic. Um, it, it collective bargaining for anyone uh, who has done it is um, a, a, about as confrontational um, as a high stakes murder trial uh, between two sides. Um, the only difference is at a collective bargaining table, there's nobody like yourself to keep me in line. Um, so uh, I, I, I tend to take advantage of that and uh, the other side takes advantage of that and, and sometimes we get after it. But I, I do think that um, the, the, the goal of collective bargaining um, is to reach um, a balanced compromise. And, and people sometimes kid themselves that this balanced compromise comes about from, from a kumbaya moment. I, I know people would want to think that, well, you know, the other side realized the, the, the value of um, daily testing and realized that it was the necessary and moral thing for everybody to do. That probably wasn't the thinking. Um, what got us there was um, an expenditure of $100 million is going to allow the players and the owners to engage in an, endev in an endeavor um, that hopefully would generate $12 billion of revenue. Um, if we do that, we'll probably still be $4 billion off of our revenue targets this year, but is $12 billion, a group of healthy players, a group of healthy coaches, and a successful business mission that's accomplished safely worth the expenditure of $100 million. And um, when you frame it that way and, and you argue about it that way, um, everything else, um, you know, you may not completely like it, but it does make sense. And, and, and I think that for all of... Um, I think that we were successful primarily because we've had so many battles in, in our past. And when you talk about the successes over the past year, I just want to look past that to the next five or 10 years. Do you see um, changes that have been made in response to the pandemic that you hope are here to stay, that will be more enduring, that have taught you a better way to do business yeah. um, beyond, beyond the pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the, the hardest and most frustrating thing about NFL football um, is um, almost everyone thinks they have, uh, well, first of all, everyone has an opinion. Um, and, and, and probably the worst thing is no one really understands the business except for the people who are in it. Um, we, we've grown up with a sense of this thing called football. And, and we all have this opinion about what needs to happen um, and what must happen because it's generally rooted in whatever type of NFL football you grew up with. If, if you grew up with football like I did in the 70s and the 80s, you, you, you are, are born into this great city. You kind of come out of the womb rooting for one team. You, you see great coaches like, like Joe Gibbs over the years. And, and your concept of NFL football is framed by what you see and what you think um, is true and what you think is right. Um, Two-a-day practices, guys just working around the clock, um, playing when you're injured. If you, had a, if you had your bell rung, you went back in the game, and that showed a tremendous amount of courage. If, uh, if you had a severe leg injury, you nonetheless – limped your way through because you were a gladiator. It, it just so happens that all of that makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> um, <laughs> it just doesn't. Um, we found out in 2009, 2010, that our players were far more likely to suffer serious concussions during a second practice of two-a-days. So we argued get rid of two-a-day practices. Um, we found out that more concussions were being suffered um, after training camp because uh, teams were engaged in um, multiple days of padded practice. And at the end of the day, if you were a veteran in this National Football League, um, the season became something, I'm sorry, practice became something that you had to endure in order just to try to play another year. 
more of our players were getting hurt in practice than they were getting hurt in games. I'm not a, I don't know anything about football, but I know that doesn't make any sense. So we started to, to change things. And I think going forward with COVID, um, you know, we have a number of players who, who still go to um, um, off season training activities. Those things are, are purely voluntary. Um, if you listen to, to coaches like, like John Harbaugh, you, He'd almost make it sound like that it's impossible to even play NFL football if you don't engage in OTAs. I mean, he and I disagree about virtually everything on the planet. <laughs> but the one thing that I have going for me is when I look at the fact that no one went to OTAs last year, we ended up with a fantastic com- uh, season that was highly competitive, largest number of points ever scored um, in the National Football League. Um, one of the lowest lowest um, um, uh, periods of injury that I've seen in in 12 years. Penalties were an all time low, and it just so happened that we finished the same 256 games on time. We crowned a national championship um, on time, and and I'm looking at a group of players who not only feel better, but a group of players who missed less time. Uh, for injuries than at any other recorded time in the history of the National Football League. I think that's a pretty good example uh, of showing that OTAs may not make any sense whatsoever. So we're going to be fighting to, to, to keep a lot of those things going, going forward. Again, they're subject to collective bargaining. Um, we're going to have to talk to the league about those things. But COVID has taught us that you could play this game a lot smarter um, you can allow players to have a lot more time at home with their families and, and, and allow them to be more mentally refreshed. Um, and we can keep a whole heck of a lot of people a lot safer than we've done in the past. Um, and that takes a lot of leadership. And, and for the National Football League, that leadership is going to come down to whether Roger Goodell, uh, uh, Rob, Bob Kraft, Jerry Jones, um, and John Mara um, – can, can show a level of leadership that will protect and ensure the success of this game over the next decade. And just for the benefit of everybody watching, so I'm not sure if, if we touched on it. Could you just remind me what an OTA, what OTAs is? <laughs> Sorry about that. It's okay. Organized training activities. So um, back in 2011, when we, we did my, the, the first collective bargaining agreement, We shortened the amount of time that players could even be asked Mm -hmm. to come back during the off season uh, because we, we looked at a lot of data and, and, and probably one of the most impactful pieces of data um, that, that we looked at over the period of three years was um, um, the, the, the body's inability to rest and recover um, is inextricably tied to both the number and severity of injuries um, that that NFL players um, have going forward, and and the league, you know, tended to take the the position that well, you know, if a player goes down, as long as you know, as long as the quarterback doesn't go down, or the wide receiver doesn't go down, or my left tackle goes down, I mean, it, it, we want to make sure that those guys aren't aren't really exposed to a lot of injury because those are those are unique. Um, um, positions. But the league almost had a philosophy that everybody else in this business was fungible and replaceable. And and so if you buy into a system where you don't care if a large majority of people are getting hurt because you can replace them, to me, that is not an incredibly moral system but it also isn't a system that makes a whole heck of a lot of sense if, if you're a veteran who is likely to make the team and you have to go through a gauntlet of the offseason in order to reach a contract and get paid for when the season started. So, um, you know, a lot of this is, um, you know, as some would say that, you know, I'm in the business to kill football. Um, I'm in the business to protect our players. And the last time I checked, almost no one uh, would pay money to, to watch an owner run up and down the field, except maybe, maybe me. I'd, I'd, I'd pay a little bit of money. I'd pay a little bit of that. You and I could, uh, could I have, think a of a couple owners I'd want yeah, to watch. We'd have, we'd have some chuckles in the stands watching. That. <laughs> um, well, given your unique experience really on the cutting edge of reopening a business, 
if I were to hire you as a consultant for the course, I couldn't afford you. <laughs> uh, but if we could afford you uh, as a consultant, and if you had a piece of advice or two about what courts should be thinking about, what their employees should be thinking about, when determining how they should reopen safely. Are there, are there any things that jump to the front of your mind? I, you know, I think that um, having a philosophy that, that you're going to follow, follow the science, and, I, and, and, and we use that as a mantra over and over and over again, um, especially given some of the things that, that, that we were um, forced to even hear over the previous year. Um, that had nothing to do with science um, and and nothing to do with public health. Um, early on, uh, probably the best thing that I read, um, and I read it over two days because it was utterly terrifying, was the John Barry book on the 1918 inf- influenza outbreak, and 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 that became my small B Bible for carrying us through um, the entire season. I, I, there are a lot of takeaways from that book, but one. One is make sure you are following the science, and and that means not 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 underappreciating, but also not overappreciating risk. Um, second is being completely flexible and malleable about your circumstance, and and for us, you know, as you saw during the season, we made we made dozens and dozens of of changes to our protocols over time. Um, and, and the reason why we approached it from a somewhat flexible, fungible, malleable way of thinking about it was, um, it was it was too hard to think about our protocols being written in a way where they were going to be static from week one and then to week to week 16, 17, 18, right? Um, actually going into it with an idea that we were going to be flexible gave us a tremendous amount of um Comfort's probably not not the right word, but a tremendous amount of confidence that we could tweak and change the protocols going forward. Um, So I think for a court system that that requires um, requires access and and requires um, uh, it to be open in in order to to be a, a mainstay in our democracy you almost start off with with something that I didn't start off with. Um, you are a necessary and essential business. Um, football is not. Um, and and starting with the necessity and, and, and the the essential nature of your business, you know that you have to come up with um, flexible and 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 workable solutions that, by the way, aren't going to be perfect. And, and, and dealing with it and accepting the fact that you're going to be confronted with perfect problems with imperfect solutions um, um, is something that, you know, certainly won't, won't make any of you sleep better at night. But, uh, but knowing that you don't have to be perfect, you have to try to create a working environment that's as safe as possible and practical, practicable. Uh, and, and, and for us, um, that, that became really the way in which we thought about um, an NFL season. Um, and, and again, um, I, I come very cheap. If you can just arrange, you know, a, a, a short, a short murder trial with all that, it's all that I would ask. Um, um, but yeah, I miss, I miss probably the thing I miss the most about this job is I miss the courtroom. Um, well, as we're running out of time, I just have one last question for you, D. Um, I asked you this about the, the league, but on a more personal level, uh, are there changes to your life? We've all undergone a lot of changes over the last year. Yeah. How much travel we've had, being able to go out or not. Um, do you see any changes in your personal life over the last year that you view as positive changes? Um, things that you hope will endure uh, beyond the pandemic itself? Oh, absolutely. I, I, um, I averaged, uh, about 120, 130 plane flights a year. Um, I'm never doing that again, ever, <laughs> ever. Uh, now that said, probably, uh, if you ask my wife, she might be actually unhappy with that because I've been home so much, but, you know, to your point, I, I've really enjoyed being connected with the family again. Um, you know, that the, the, the first few months um, after March, you know, we kind of all found ourselves, you know, with a hard, you know, literally a hard stop. Um, and we were home. And, and at least for me, 
um, given the the schedule that I have, it was really, you know, you know, we, we always come home and we always, you know, either able to have dinner with our family or sleep in our own beds. But the, the pace of our jobs sometimes um, it, it enables um, us to uh, not be connected at home. And, and I've really um, enjoyed being connected, um, you know, long dinners and, and games at home and, you know, the inability of, of being able to travel. Um, I think for our staff, we, we've, you know, successfully uh, put our staff in a position to accomplish all of their work remotely. They've performed extremely well. Um, it'll probably change how we think about our office footprint. Um, and, and for us, um, um, I, I do want to come up with a way of making sure that um, our staff is able to be more, um, more connected at home. And, and so, you know, I hope we don't creep back um, when we do start getting a little bit back to normal, hopefully soon. Uh, I am going to institute a, a few things about um, eliminating uh, anybody except for an emergency, contacting people after five, six o'clock, uh, because I think that we can get our jobs done uh, uh, between the day. And I think it's important uh, for, for all of us as, as you know, leaders um, in, in organizations to take all of this that we learned from COVID and, and maybe we can figure out a way to, to have a better quality of life. Well, thank you so much, Dee, uh, for being here, for joining us as I, I believe our first virtual keynote speaker uh, at the DC uh, Judicial and Bar Conference. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's been a privilege speaking with you and thank you so much. Well, thank you. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to um, a number of colleagues and, and judges out there who uh, were patient with me when I was a young lawyer. Um, I learned so much from each and every one of you and, and um um, really enjoyed being a, a active member of this bar and thank you Judge Deal and everyone else for this conference. Um, everything you do is so important um, in our democracy and I, I was fortunate to be able to grow up and, and learn from such a tremendous group of jurists and lawyers um, in the DC bar. So thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us. Steve. I wish to extend a special thank you to Damara Smith and to Judge Deal for that fascinating and most relevant discussion on how the NFL and its players have coped and continue to cope with the pandemic. I am confident that our attendees can learn from your example. Thank you both so very much. As we head into our breakout sessions for today, I would like to welcome your feedback on the 2021 District of Columbia Judicial and Bar Conference. Please take a moment to complete the post-event survey. Your survey results will help us develop a better judicial and bar conference that meets your needs and will let us know how we did with this first ever virtual judicial and bar conference. Uh, just a reminder, uh, the same as you did yesterday, if you are planning on joining the breakout sessions, go to the left side of your screen and click on the menu tab labeled breakout sessions. Then click on the program of your choice. For those of you who are not able to continue with us, I would like to take this time to thank you for attending our conference. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to the DC Bar for their partnership in hosting this conference and to the court and the bar staff for all their hard work to ensure the success of this program during these unusual times. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.